Okay, uh, welcome everyone. It's uh, my big pleasure to introduce today Yuri Chinkel from uh, uh, New York University and from Simons Foundation. And uh, Yuri will speak about uh, recent discovery in equivariant birational geometry, equivariant birational types. Well, thank you for the introduction. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, all right, so the main problem in equivariant birational geometry is to distinguish uh, actions of let's say finite groups on algebraic varieties by rational uh, actions. So in particular, you would like to understand embeddings of finite groups into the Cremona group. And the plan for the talk is I will discuss some known invariants and abstractions. Uh, uh, I'll define new invariants uh, uh, that uh, came from joint work uh, with uh, uh, Konsevich and Pestun, and also Andrew Crash. And then I'll talk about some examples and applications. And uh, finally, you know, I'll show you some structure in these new invariants. So there is a new paper on my web page uh, concerning this last topic. Now, uh, the basic setup is uh, there is a Algebraic to closed ground field, uh, characteristic zero, G is a finite group. Uh, we can assume that G acts regularly on um, some smooth projective variety. Uh, fixed points denoted like this. And some of the basic facts in this field are uh, if you have a cyclic group and X is rational, then we have to have fixed points. Uh, if the group is abelian, then having fixed points is a birational invariant. And uh, if uh, X and Y are you know, stably birational equivariantly, uh, stably birational varieties, then uh, the group cohomology H1, G acting on the Picard of one and on the other, they have to be the same for all subgroups. And this is called, uh, H1 triviality when it's zero. Now, uh, some basic fact is if you have a cyclic group acting on a surface, a rational surface, then having a curve of uh, genus at least one uh, tells you something in the fixed locus, tells you something about uh, this cohomological invariant H1. So there is a, a more sophisticated invariant for actions of abelian groups, uh, going back to Reichstein and Hewson. Uh, so you look at, uh, let's say, linear representations of abelian groups of some rank, and then you look at the characters that appear in these representations. And so there is actually a criterion for when these two are equivalently birational. And that is if and only if the determinant, uh, one and the other, are equal up to plus minus one. And of course, the determinant is zero if the rank of the Abelian subgroup is strictly less than the dimension of the representation. So, okay, cyclic like actions, therefore, uh, linear actions on Pn for n bigger equal than two are all equivalent to birational. And uh, you should also note that if you look of uh, faithful representations of a group, uh, then they are always stably birational. Therefore, having this distinction between birationality, stable birationality, is actually quite interesting for groups, group representations. Okay. So uh, the starting point of the work with Maxime was, uh, uh, well, what happens for the simplest actions? Let's say we have an abelian group, let's say a cyclic group even acting. So, and let's look at what we are presented with. Uh, we can decompose the fixed point locus into strata, the disjoint strata, and you can just record the eigenvalues of the group uh, in the tangent space to the variety at some of the point in those strata. Of course, it doesn't depend on which point you are at generically. So, uh, and then you can just put uh, as a piece of information, just a formal sum over all the fixed strata of you know, these eigenvalues. And uh, we keep no information whatsoever about the geometry of the uh, fixed locus. So uh, therefore, consider the free abelian group 
that is spent by unordered tuples. After all, we don't know which eigenvalue is first, which is second. These are tuples of characters of our group appearing in somewhere. And uh, well, what is the condition? So we want uh, those uh, characters to span the dual of our group, the character group. And so we get a map from uh, G varieties uh, to uh, this uh, you know, symbols group S N of G, uh, simply by assigning you know, the sum that I wrote down, sum over all uh, fixed loci of you know, these collections. And then if you want this to be a variational invariant, uh, you would like to impose relations so that whenever you have a G equivariant blow up, uh, you get this. The difference should be zero. So this has a kind of relations that we'd like to impose. So it turns out that these relations can be encoded in a very compact form. And here it is. Uh, consider the quotient of this uh, three symbols group by the relations, which go like this. Uh, again, so if you have A1, A2, uh, so then the relation is A1, A2, and then all the rest is equal to A1 minus A2, A2, and all the rest, plus A1, A2 minus A1, and all the rest, if A1 is not equal to A2. And if they're equal, then just write A1 comma zero and then everything else. And that's it. It turns out that these imply everything inside. So uh, the class that we uh, obtain in the quotient by these relations is a well-defined G equivariant by rational invariant. And so what do we use? We use equivariant uh, weak factorization, nothing else. And then of course, compute simply explicitly what happens under these blowups. And this is what comes out after a lot of combinatorics, I should say. Now, uh, if we forget about geometry and just look at generators and relations, so we get a system of linear equations. And uh, for n equals two, n is a dimension, we find that uh, the Q rank of the vectors, I mean, the groups that we defined is P squared minus one over 24 plus one. We just did it and like, try it, you know, Z mod five, Z mod seven, this is what comes out. And so that's of course very interesting. And especially the 24. And then we started looking uh, at what happens for n bigger equal than three. Now you see, because of uh, the symmetry here, uh, what you get is a highly overdetermined system of linear equations. So this is the vector space, but, you know, these symbols and these are the linear relations. And so it's not at all clear that you get any solutions, but you find that the Q rank will be three is actually P squared minus one over 24 plus one, what we had before minus P minus one over two. And you think this is great, but the computer keeps you know, running and suddenly at 43, there is a jump. And then at 59, 67, 83, you have these extra dimensions that you didn't expect. So these are very interesting groups. Uh, in fact, after again, some further investigations and turn out that they are closer related to cohomology of arithmetic groups, in particular admit Hecke operators. Um, so there's a variant that we can introduce, namely uh, you can put the sign in and out. So you introduce an additional relation on these groups. Like whenever you see a minus sign, you just pull it out. And then it turns out that uh, if you look at the linear action of a cyclic group on PN, we know all of them are equal, uh, then the corresponding class that you computed is torsion in B and G and trivial in B and minus G. Okay, so we want to uh, distinguish actions, so. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, when, you, when you said for different value or for those special values of P it jumps, what, what do you mean by that? Sorry for the special values of P jumps the rank. So if uh, you compute Z mod P, G is Z mod P, okay? Yeah. And if you compute the Q rank, this is a closed formula. And then suddenly in addition to these, you get one extra class for 43 and maybe two for 67. So you get some extra dimensions in the, in the group. Okay, you so see? that formula doesn't hold 
for those values of p. In the formula doesn't hold. There is some excess. There are some excess dimensions. Okay. Thank you. And so we investigated this some further. So, and there are tables. You can find these tables in our paper. And there are also extra jumps when you look at mod p because there's also interesting torsion in these groups and so on and so on. And also, this is quite interesting, but let me you know, just nail down on one slide what the connection is to arithmetic groups. So it turns out that the Q vector space B and minus uh, is actually the same thing as uh, cohomology of some very concrete congruent subgroups that shows up in GL and Z. Now this or R is just a sign of the determinant representation. And Steinberg is a Steinberg representation, kind of a dualizing module in the theory of arithmetic groups. So again, there's a whole part of the first paper that discusses this and how they got there and what it means. And in particular, this also explains uh, those jumps that you asked about, because there are some extra jumps and cohomologies that you find. All right, so that was kind of the starting point and I talked about some geometric applications already of this theory, where we only keep track of uh, loci with maximal stabilizer name is a full group and the group had to be a billion. And so uh, in uh, uh, so uh, the next stage, uh, Andrew Crash and I looked at general groups, not necessarily abelian groups and uh, introduced invariants that are more refined that keep much more information about the action. Now, so G is non-abelian but H is going to be an abelian subgroup in G. So uh, we will have birational equivalence classes of algebraic varieties, which is a function fields. This is going to be the birational type of the fixed uh, stratum. Uh, then there is this uh, uh, isomorphism classes of Gallo algebras over you know, a birational type actually, or some function field. Uh, for the group, which is a normalizer of H and G divided by H. And then there is some cohomological assumption that I don't want to explain. It's important and uh, for the definition. So this is sort of a field theoretic, group theoretic uh, formalism. And now comes the groups that will capture invariants, namely, we look at the Z module generated by symbols abelian subgroup of G, normalizer divided by H acting on some K, which is an algebra, and beta. So uh, beta is simply a sequence of characters of H that generate uh, uh, the, the, the character group, the character group H check, and they should be non-zero, all of them non-zero, all right? So this is uh, the, the, the analog of SN of G from before, uh, no relations whatsoever. Now the characters, of course, are, you don't care about the order of the characters. Again, it's up to order. Now I should say right away that in the initial papers, the ones that you find on archive, uh, the formalism is in terms of normalizers of H. There is also a version uh, with centralizers uh, it, it makes you know some other things a little bit easier, other things more complicated. So uh, initially, we took normalizers, but one can, one can also formulate everything with centralizers. So and now the relations. So the first relation is that uh, you don't care about conjugation. So, but uh, and so what does it mean? So you see. Oh, maybe a little later. And then the blow up relations, the most interesting thing. Uh, the blow up relations go like this. The first one is trivial. Whenever you see two entries in the characters that sum to zero, then the whole symbol is zero. But the second one, this is the actual, the non trivial relation. And it has two terms. One term is zero whenever you see two entries equal in, the, in, in those characters. And otherwise, it's a sum where as before, as in the case of abelian actions and maximal stabilizers, we look at B1, B2 minus B1, 
and on everything else. And then B2, which is B1 minus B2, B2, and everything else. And theta two is the other thing, which is zero if some of the BIs happen to be in B1 minus B2. And otherwise, you pass to a different group, you quotient your character group by the subgroup generated by this difference. Okay, you call it H bar. Then you reduce all the characters. So you look at the image of everything in the group H bar. This is what you record. And then there is this action of N bar on some other field K bar. This K bar is essentially K adjoint one extra variable, transcendental variable. And then you still have to explain what the action is. And the only way to get it, to understand what everything is, of course, we have it well defined in our papers. So the model case that you should look at, what happens when you take an isolated uh, uh, fixed point is an abelian stabilizer on a surface and you blow it up. And what happens then? And then, so you have an exceptional curve and then uh, depending on what the eigenvalues for the action are in the tangent space, uh, okay, you're blowing up A2 and zero and uh, you have some, you know, A1 and two going in two directions, you blow up and then, well, you have the exceptional curve, you have the two on, on the curve, you have, you know, two fixed points, two extra fixed points. In the formalism, this maxim is simply ignored completely the contribution uh, from the exceptional curve. And we only recorded what happened at those two fixed points. And that explains the shape of the relations when you only look at maximal stabilizers. But now you see if you have the exceptional curve, the stabilizer is smaller along the generic point of the exceptional curve. And then you have to look at exactly what happens in the normal bundle to it. And anyway, once you've done this computation, you know exactly what to put here and here and here. But let's take it as is, it's a bit formal and this is it. So now this is the group that's gonna capture uh, our invariants. And uh, well, first I have to tell you how to compute the class of a variety with a group action. Well, using equivalent birational modifications, equivalent blobs, we can arrive at a standard model. Uh, standard model has the following properties. So X is smooth projective. There is some the risky open subset on which G acts freely. The complement is a normal crossings divisor. And then, and that's sort of an essential property. For every G in the group and every irreducible component of the boundary, either the group element maps a component to itself or it maps it to another component, which is disjoint from the component that you're looking at. So uh, this standard model uh, came up in the work of Reichstein and Hewson. And um, um, it's, of course, once you reach it, all further equivalent blowups will, will keep it. And so it's the model or a model on which uh, our invariant is computed. And how is it computed? So we take this model, we sum over all conjugacy classes of the billion subgroups of our group G, now, uh, so this H, the abelian subgroup, it's, uh, it's gonna be the stabilizer of a generic point of some stratum. And then you look at what can happen to the stratum. So either the stratum gets uh, translated by the remaining action of G, or there is some part of G that still acts on the function field of the stratum. And this is what this, and acting on K of F and codes. So here K of F is, well, if it's you know, reducible, it would be action of the function field, but otherwise it's you, it, it's sort of the algebra, the N algebra that you see when you have several components, the products of these function fields. And beta here, beta F of X, it records generic eigenvalues of H in the normal bundle along that stratum. So uh, 
Uh, this is a sum, a formal sum a priori. And uh, you know, the last thing to, to mention, of course, on a standard model, all stabilizers are abelian and all symbols satisfy the assumption ones that I didn't explain in great detail. So in other words, you can just forget about assumption one. You say, whatever is computed is computed on a standard model. The reason we put it in is, you see, we have a completely abstract definition that doesn't even refer to anything. It just refers to function fields and, and, and group actions. And in this language, we are not seeing any models. In this language, it's meaningful to, uh, to put down assumption one. And assumption one uh, you know, allows us to write down relations as we did. If you drop assumption one, relations would be much more complicated. Anyway, uh, there is also assumption two that satisfied on a, on a standard model. So now we are in geometry. Namely, we look at uh, uh, G linearized line bundles on X. And essentially assumption two is saying that we have enough of those G linearized line bundles on X. Well, formally it's a composite homomorphism from here to here is surjective for, for the characters of H for all H. Okay. So, and standard model, as I said, applies assumption two, assumption two implies assumption one. Now, the theorem is that this class, uh, you write down everything on a standard model and then you impose the relations that I described is a well-defined G equivariant by rational invariant. So uh, now let's try to apply it. Uh, there is a very big literature. Uh, for G action and actions of abelian groups, for example, on surfaces. And the, the main thing that comes out is that uh, if there is no curve of genus at least one in the fixed locus uh, for the full group or for some subgroup of G, again, they're in the abelian case, then all actions are linear with the exception of one fixed point free action of Z2 times Z4. So this uh, showed up in Blanc's thesis uh, in particular. Uh, and this is kind of a pretty complete uh, description because if you have a curve of genus at least one in the fixed locus, then every G equivariant blow up, the curve is not going to go away. It was fixed by G before, whatever you blow up, it's gonna be on every equivariant by rational model. So in particular, when we look at B2 of G, it, it won't give us anything new in dimension two. Uh, you know, actions of abelian groups on surfaces are understood, but uh, this beta of G, it enters into the coefficients, uh, you see, into relations coefficients in uh, those higher dimensional Burnside groups. And also actually in uh, Burnside group in dimension two, when you take into account not just a fixed low side, but everything else. So let me give you uh, a new example or well, an example. So let's look at the simplest non-abelian group acting on surfaces. The simplest would be S3, but let's look at C2, uh, like Z mod two times S3 acting on P2. So we're gonna act as follows. We're gonna take the two dimensional representation of S3 or a standard one, and you're going to twist it by the sign Z mod two, and then I is going to be the trivial representation, and then we projectivize trivial plus two dimensional, and we get an action on P two. So let's try to analyze the action. So we need to compute uh, first of all a standard model. Uh, the way I set up the action, I have a fixed point at one zero zero for the full group, and the group is non-abelian, so I need to blow it up. After I blow up this fixed point, I get an exceptional curve. And that exceptional curve is actually stabilized by the central involution because on this V2, my Z mod two acts diagonally minus one minus one. And so when I projectivize, I get no action of C2 on the exceptional curve, but I get an action of S3. So after the blow up, I have a symbol exceptional curve is Z mod two stabilizer and S3 acting on P1. And of course, Z mod two, non-trivial action, uh, eigenvalue one in, in the normal bundle. Now, additionally, 
uh, look, there is also a line, namely the projectivization of this V2 inside P2. So there is a distinguished line, but because here the stabilizer again is Z mod two minus one minus one acting of C2 on this V2. So I get an additional symbol, again, the stabilizer C2, and again, the S3 acting on that line. And how does it act? Well, it's a projectivization of two-dimensional representation, there is an action of S3. And it's the same symbol. Now, of course, there are also other terms. There are also other things, the stabilizers and so on and so on, but let's not look at them for now. Let's just ignore them for now. Now, there is also an action of G on uh, a two-dimensional quadric. So I'm gonna write down a quadric. So here's a quadric uh, in uh, P3. I'm gonna permute the coordinates here and the involution, the central involution is simply gonna switch the sign here. And so, uh, well, there are no G fixed points uh, for this action, but uh, when I look at uh, you know, what's fixed by the central involution, so this is the locus W equals zero, and that's the conic, and the conic has an S3 action on it. So it's, it's the same P1 with an S3 action, but the stabilizer Z mod two, and then there are some other terms. And the crucial difference between these two actions is that this summit, Z mod two, uh, S3 acting on P1, appears twice in the P2 model and only once in the quadric uh, surface model. And again, in the P2 model, it's the standard form of the P2 action that we have to take into account. And now no relations can eliminate this symbol and if, you know, the way to think about this action is that this P1, this an S3 action is sort of an analog of a curve of genus at least one in the fixed locus when we were talking about the billion actions. In other words, on every equivalently birational model, it's gonna show up. You cannot destroy it. It's sort of incompressible, all right? So, uh, well, so these two actions, the action on P2, and the action on this quadric are not birational. So some other examples were considered in, in papers by Banai and Toku Naga in 2007, uh, namely S4 action on, on P2, uh, which is now the projectivization of a three-dimensional representation of S4, and also on DP6. So I'm writing it in matrices the way they did it in their paper. So uh, and well, so you want to see some kind of, an, uh, well, anyway, matrices. And uh, uh, there is also another example in their paper, which is an A5 action on the projectivization of three-dimensional representation, also on DP5. And uh, uh, our invariants distinguish these actions. Again, you just compute it and, and uh, uh, this example in particular is in the paper that you that I posted yesterday to my web page. You'll find it. So it's an interesting computation. Now, when you look at uh, sort of a foundational paper, classification of finite subgroups of the plane Cremona group by Dolgachev and Raskowski. Raskowski started this whole uh, G surface analysis of G surfaces and circuits of links and so on and so on, uh, you know, many years ago. Uh, so, and you look at the last section, which, which is titled, what is open, what is, what is not known yet. Uh, in fact, just before that section is this question, are there embeddings of a finite group G into PGL3 that are not conjugate in the Cremona group? In other words, can you get an action of the same group G on P2 different actions? that are not conjugate in the, in the Cremona uh, groups, that are not birational to each other. Uh, well, the question there was, are there any? Now, of course, Ryston and Hewson provide such embeddings of abelian groups. They just take an abelian group of rank two, uh, let's say Z5 plus Z5, and um, uh, let it act on, on the 
two-dimensional representations and just pick different actions with different determinants, you can do it, it works. But in their examples, what's crucial is that uh, the group G, which might be non-abelian by the way, has to contain an abelian subgroup of rank two and the invariant is computed upon restriction to this abelian subgroup and the uh, computation of its determinant. So I wanted to show you an example where the rank condition is irrelevant. So here is the example, very similar to the one we just discussed. Instead of twisting by uh, like the character of Z mod two, let's look at Z mod five. Again, let's look at the standard two dimensional representation of S3. Let's pick a non trivial character of Z mod five. And so we get a generically free action of G on the projectivization of the trivial representation uh, and uh, this two dimensional representation of this group. Okay. So, uh, well, we can compute its class. So it turns out that the class is non trivial. But moreover, if the characters that we used here to twist, the two dimensional representation, if they are not equal up to plus minus one, if I pick chi and chi prime, which are not equal up to plus minus one, then these two actions are not birational equivalent. So I will explain this computation towards the end of my talk, but uh, so here's an example. And in fact, there is nothing special about C5. You could put Z mod P for any P bigger or equal than five. And S3 is also sort of irrelevant. You pick any finite group with a faithful two-dimensional representation, uh, you know, your favorite group, A5, or whatever. So, uh, and uh, you'll get a similar situation. So you get a huge supply of actions uh, that are not conjugate in the Cremona group. All right, now I want to discuss uh, a different class of examples related to algebraic tori. So just as a reminder, uh, an algebraic torus of dimension n. So it's a linear algebraic group, uh, which uh, we are talking here over uh, about tori over non-closed fields potentially. K is not necessarily algebraically closed. So uh, it's a K form of uh, gm to the n. So over K bar, it's gm to the n. Now, uh, since we now have a Galois group of the field acting, so it will act on the geometric character group of our torus, uh, which is you know, torsion free, uh, z to the n. And so it will act via a finite subgroup of G, L, and Z. And so in particular, we get the representation uh, from this Galois group well, onto this finite subgroup of G, L, and Z. And it turned out that the torus is uniquely determined by this representation. So there is a Galois group that is sort of field theoretic information, the Galois group. Then it maps onto some finite subgroup of GL and Z. And then everything else is sort of encoded in that finite subgroup. Now, since we're doing equivalent rational geometry, we could say, all right, like forget the field, assume the field is algebraically closed. But now let's just keep that finite subgroup of GL and Z and let's see what happens. So finite subgroups of GL and Z are of course well understood. Uh, they are listed in standard packages for small dimensions, you know, two, three, five, six. And uh, uh, well, there is of course a huge, huge literature on rationality of tori over non-closed fields. Uh, interesting examples, counter examples, and so on and so on. In particular, one of the big problems, open problems in this field is, well, uh, are stably rational tori over K rational over K? So as far as I know, this question is still open, uh, mainly because all the abstractions to rationality that have been explored in this area, they were um, of cohomological type. Uh, and uh, these kind of abstractions uh, naturally abstract stable rationality as well. So there are some more recent newer approaches to rationality of tori 
with a focus on, on the right categories and so on. And uh, here I just wanted to cite some recent you know, results, people working on this. So this is all very, very interesting over non-closed fields. But again, we can look at this uh, simply uh, in the context of G varieties and that's also meaningful. So the relevant cohomological abstractions will come from the, an exact sequence uh, that is obtained as follows. You look at some smooth projective equivariant compactification of your T, and then you look at the boundary. The boundary is the union of components. Uh, well, the geometric components, uh, well, they have to be, of course, preserved. In other words, the boundary is the permutation module. So you look at this permutation module, the Picard group is boundary divisors, you know, Z models spanned by boundary divisors, quotient out by the characters geometrically, geometrically. This exact sequence, uh, once you pass to the ground field, uh, it becomes, you know, G invariance here, G invariance here, and then you see H1G acting on M. And so that's some kind of abstraction. And so one abstraction to stable K rationality is the non-triviality of this H1G acting on pig that we saw before. Uh, in fact, for any subgroup of uh, G. All right. So in your work of non-closed fields, you really think about uh, you have the Gallo group mapping the subgroup of GL and Z, and then everything else compute in GL and Z. And so one basic result here is that this cohomological abstraction to rationality and stable rationality is the only abstraction to rationality in dimensions you know, up to three. Well, dimension two is you know, straightforward, but in dimension three, it actually required work. And more precisely, the theorem is as follows. Suppose that, that G in GL3Z, the finite subgroups through which the Gallo group acts on the torus, rather the characters of the torus. So that's, uh, suppose it contains uh, the subgroup uh, generated by these two matrices. Again, everything up to conjugation naturally. So this is a Z2 plus Z2, the Klein 4 group. Then T is not stably rational over your field. And so why is that? It's because this subgroup gives cohomology. It gives a non-trivial H1. This is of course the abstraction to stable rationality. But then you have to show that if your G does not contain this subgroup, then everything that's presented to you is actually rational. And that follows from classification. And so Konyaski completed this. So, uh, well, uh, I can't fail to mention, you know, big advances in uh, the rational geometry, uh, specialization, starting with the work of Fozen, Nikolaita uh, and Perutka, Nikias and Schindler, specialization of stable rationality, and work of Konsevich and myself on specialization of rationality. So uh, these kind of techniques, specializing a variety, looking at special families of varieties, specializing them to mind the singular varieties, finding abstractions like H1, G acting on Picard uh, to uh, rationality, and then concluding something about the, the general fiber. So this has very, very good uh, approaches and new results have been established using these techniques. So I wanted to uh, give you an application which is based on you know, these tori in dimension three. So let's look at the intersection of tocodrix and P5, uh, smooth one, but uh, it's, it, it can degenerate to a singular toric threefold. So this is a toric threefold. You know, one monomial is equal to another monomial, and here another monomial equal to another monomial. This is an intersection of two quadrics, somewhat singular uh, and toric, which, as you can see, in addition to the torus section, also has an action of C2 uh, times uh, S4, okay? Now let's uh, look at the following situation. Suppose you have a field, 
This is officially a large Galois group. A number field function field of a curve. The only thing we need is that the Galois group can subject onto the Klein four group. Okay. So then we can twist the storic threefold and get a model over that non closed field, which would fail stable rationality. Because with this kind of twist uh, of the torus, uh, we'll, get in, we'll, we'll get cohomology in the torus. Well, well, that will tell us that there will exist smooth final threefolds as above intersections of two quadrics and P5 over this kind of field, failing stable rationality. So all you need to do is to be able to degenerate to this particular model, this particular threefold. The same idea showed up in the paper by Kuznetsov and Proctor that was just posted. Uh, rather than looking at the intersections of two quadrics and P5, they look at Fano hypersurfaces of degree uh, one, 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 one in like P1 to the four, and then they degenerate these hypersurfaces to a singular, again, toric threefold given by this equation. You see, monomial equal to monomial. So it's a toric threefold. And again, you see that the automorphism group contains K4. Again, you see the S4 acting and the uh, C2, the involution, you can just exchange, you know, the U's and the V's. So again, once you produce a field, this Gallo group subjecting onto this K4, you can use that Gallo action to twist this variety. And then uh, you show that the general one, final threefold of this type will fail stable rationality. Okay, so, uh, well, let's look at dimension four. So I wanted to mention some, uh, you know, really great work by uh, Lemire, who is speaking in this seminar, I think, you know, later this season. Uh, so the bottom line there is that there are 10 conjugacy classes of subgroups of GL4Z. Uh, so in fact, it's the subgroups of these two types, subgroups of C2 times A5 or C2 times S4. So these are particular embeddings of these groups into GL4Z, where all the cohomological abstractions are actually trivial. And moreover, stable rationality for those tori is known, but the rationality of the corresponding tori is unknown. Now, again, there they talk about, you know, Gallo actions, but, you know, from perspective, you know, the G equivariant case is also open there. So uh, let's focus on the group C2 times A5 in GL4Z. Now, the action is very explicit. Uh, so you need to realize, uh, you know, this through some matrices. And how do you get uh, the, the A5 to, you know, sit in GL4Z? Well, there is a four dimensional representation and actually the matrices are all integral. And the central C2 acts diagonally, uh, like minus one, minus one, minus one. Now this is not a linear action anymore. This is a non-linear action on the torus. It's an action via the characters. In other words, it's an action on the, on the exponents of the monomials. Now a compactification of this uh, torus, it's a four dimensional torus, is again, you look at P1 to the five, you look at this equation, and now A5 is going to permute the indices, and C2 will exchange x's and y's. So, well, the, because the C2 acts diagonally, minus one, minus one, minus one, the only G fixed point is the origin. So, after blowing up the origin, you get the symbol. So, C2, you have to projectivize, so to speak, the tangent space. The tangent space is, of course, uh, the W4 representation. So you have C2, the generic stabilizer, and then the A5 action on, on uh, P3, which is projectivization of the four dimensional representation. Okay. Now let's compare this action to action on, on P4. Like are these two actions by rational? Like what kind of actions of P4 on P4, linear actions on P4 can we, can we have? Well, you, for you, example, you can ask a question. Yes. 
Uh, when you say the origin, what do you mean? Which origin? Well, in one, 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 the Taurus. The ah, origin is the Lee algebra. Oh, in the Taurus, okay. In the Taurus, it's the origin of the Taurus. So, uh, well, let's look at the linear. We want to compare this nonlinear action to linear actions, right? So linear representation of G, for example, one trivial representation plus four dimensional thing projectivized. That will give us a T4. And again, the C2 will act with a minus one on the W4 diagonally and the four dimensional piece is whatever it is. And as before, we have a fixed point here coming from the trivial representation, which we need to blow up. It's a fixed point for the whole group. And then we have a P3 at infinity, which is just a projectivization of this thing. And in particular, this action will contribute two such symbols. And well, in one case, you have one such symbol. In the other case, you have uh, two such symbols. They are sort of not compressible. The actions are not birational. Now, I, so these are the kind of applications. And uh, given you know, all the impact of specialization over non closed fields and looking geometric setups, uh, it also made sense to talk about specialization of varieties with G actions. So, uh, and then we ran into, you know, some combinatorial technical difficulties to define it appropriately. So uh, to do it, uh, we introduced invariants of quasi-projective varieties. So here is a naive invariant. The naive invariant is precisely as before. You simply don't care. Is U projective, non-projective? You just look at uh, abelian subgroups you uh, find sub-varieties with generic stabilizer with abelian subgroup, of course, it's up to conjugacy. And then you record everything inside and that's it. So the naive invariant is a variational invariant. But the issue here is that the boundary does not carry enough information about the action when we do it like this. So, Needless to say, the formulas that I'm writing down are all inspired by periodic motivic integration, but you know you don't need to draw the connection. This is just purely geometric formulas here. So to do the correct uh, definition, the correct definition goes like this: pick some compactification of your open U, and then. Uh, uh, with all the properties, uh, you know, union of strata, strata intersect, and so on and so on. And then define the correct, the not naive invariant in the following fashion. Uh, put uh, the invariant that you already defined for smooth projective X. And then uh, look at the alternating sum plus minus plus minus of the naive classes of the total space of normal bundles to the strata with a, with a G action, of course. So, well, if you've seen these kind of formulas in periodic integration, these normal bundles, it's like jet spaces, iterated first, like pieces of jet spaces. Anyway, this is a formula. So uh, this is a birational invariant. These classes, if you just write these classes, they generate the burn side group, burn and G. In other words, you can write every symbol in terms of uh, combinations of these classes with integral coefficients. And uh, the theorem is that uh, using this kind of formalism, viewing this in the relative setting, namely, so here we worked with an open U and there's some kind of boundary, X minus U. But in the relative setting, the open, is sort of everything else but the special fiber. The special fiber is the boundary. And so using the formula that I wrote down appropriately, we get actually a well-defined homomorphism from the Burnside group of the fraction field of your DVR uh, to the Burnside group of the residue field. And so with this, you can show that uh, G actions uh, specialize. So if you had, uh, you know, if it's a generic fibers, they're equivalently birational. And let's say you're on the smooth family, then special fibers are also equivalently birational, which may be of interest, some applications. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, 
we also allow mild singularities. Um, there is a definition of what we call BG rational singularities following a tradition, you know, from rational singularities to L rational singularities to, anyway. So uh, there is a definition, which is kind of a tautological, uh, which simply says that uh, whatever the singularities are, the classes you compute are independent, but you also need sort of a checkable computable uh, definition. And uh, so here is an example of the singular locus uh, is if, if the singularities of your special fiber are just rational double points and G X simply transitively on those, then, then that special fiber has BG rational singularities. It will be interesting to explore this notion you know, further. So this is not all. So I wanted to tell you about the most recent things uh, in that, that paper from yesterday with Andrew Crash. Uh, the burn side groups have a very rich internal structure. So uh, we can filter them in many, many ways. So here I show you one way to get some kind of piece out of the burn side group that may already be interesting and meaningful. So we look at pairs HY, where H is as before an abelian subgroup of G, and Y is a subgroup of the centralizer of H, modulo H. So we look at these things that are closed under conjugation, of course, we allow conjugation by elements of G. And then we look at this piece, burn and H of G is the quotient of the burn side group by the subgroup generated by classes of the form where H and Y are not in this bold face H. And K is actually a field and not an algebra. And the theorem is that, well, if you pick such a pre-filter with you know, some, some obvious conditions here, uh, then you can write down explicitly what the burn uh, and H is. So uh, it will be generated by these symbols now with H, Y in H. In other words, we can really separate uh, you know, the full group and now the conjugation blow up relations, you see, rather than checking these conjugation blow up relations on everything inside, you only need to check the conjugation and blow up relations on the symbols which have the H and Y in this potentially much, much smaller piece. Now, this is kind of abstract, but you know, I'll give you an example in a minute. Another thing that we established. Uh, so we want to understand basic geometric constructions, uh, uh, like basic things that you can do with G varieties. For example, let's look at the projectivization of some line bundles over your G variety. So we pick G linearized line bundles uh, and you have to have some conditions, namely the G action on the total projectivization of you know, some of these line bundles uh, has to satisfy assumption two. I mean, there are some minor conditions that are actually satisfied on you know, applications that you would be interested in. Then we can compute the class of the total space of the sum of these line bundles in terms of the class uh, of the variety downstairs, plus you know, some certain things about these line bundles it's, it's an unpleasant combinatorial formula. I didn't want to put it in here, but you can find it in the paper. That is sort of a formula that does it. Now, the application of this goes like this. Let's look at our group from before, C5 times S3, acting on P1. And as before, how does it act? We have a reducible two-dimensional representation of S3, and we twist it by C5. And of course, C5 will, you know, won't act on the projectivization, but so now we take uh, a sum of uh, two line bundles. So L0 is going to be the trivial line bundle. L1 is a twist of OP1 of 1 by non trivial character chi of C5. And then let's try to compute the projectivization of the sum of two line bundles over P1. It's, it has a G action, and the G action satisfies the conditions that we needed to apply our theorem. Now the vibration formula that I didn't write down for you uh, spits out this, this sum, like sum of symbols, symbol, 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 symbol. Now, 
I hope you see why we wanted to introduce these filtrations so that we don't have to look at all the other terms that are sort of not really relevant for what you want to say. What you want to say is that the vibration formula produces two terms like this, C5 stabilizer and then S3 acting on P1 character chi, and then C5 is reacting one character minus chi. Okay. Now you apply this to the pre-filter consisting of the group C5 and S3. That's a filter, pre-filter. It satisfies the conditions of this theorem that I gave you. So you have a projection from the full Burnside group into this uh, chopped down Burnside group. The beauty here is that again, you only need to check relations that involve, you know, like with C5 and nothing else matters. And when you do this projection, you obtain precisely this class that was in red on the previous slide and not all the other stuff that's floating around there. Well, you look at this class, the class in this group is non-zero. This group is much, much smaller. It's much easier to check relations and generate the spin relations and so on. Moreover, these classes are different when you pick chi's, uh, you know, that different, you know, chi and chi prime, remember? So you could put chi, it's a character of Z mod five, as plus minus one, or you could put chi as plus minus two. And so the classes are different. And that explains uh, the example that I gave you before. Geometrically, the situations that I gave you rise as follows. You look at this representation, sum of a trivial and the twisted two-dimensional representation. You give a generically free action, get a generic free action on P2 as before. There is a fixed point. You blow up this fixed point to get into a situation, the standard form where assumption two is satisfied. And then of course you have exactly the class of a sum of two land bundles with a G action, and that's where you compute and so on. And that's how you get it. The last thing I wanted to mention in the last minute is that you can just completely ignore all the field information and just focus on groups and subgroups. And so you get is a combinatorial symbols group generated by symbols H, Y, beta. Y is the subgroup of a centralizer modulo H. And there are some relations, conjugation, well, reordering and conjugation relations, which are sort of straightforward and automatic. But the non-trivial relation is this one, the blow-up relation that now is completely combinatorial, has nothing field theoretic to it. And uh, well, you can look at the triple as before with a field information and you just ignore it and send it to a triple that has no field information. So you get a map from the Burnside group to this combinatorial Burnside group. And so for abelian groups, you get exactly what we had before. If you hit the things that you defined, there's all the constructions that we had in particular with a filter consisting of G is a full group and a trivial subgroup. And then we have this diagram. Uh, and then, well, uh, I showed you that B and G is related to cohomology of arithmetic groups. Well, what about a B, C, N of G? I don't know. So uh, clearly, you know, a lot more needs to be done, uh, you know, exploring with incriminatorial constructions already. And just to summarize, we've discussed uh, this symbols group, groups. Uh, I showed you some applications to the intersectionality. And again, I want to <laughs> re-emphasize these groups have an intricate internal structure, both arithmetically and geometrically. All right, thank you. Yuri, thank you for excellent talk. Beautiful. Well, thanks, Yuri. Uh, I, I, I just digest. So this this is, was very nice. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, questions, please ask questions. Uh, I have general questions. Okay, I have several questions, well, some particular and uh, some general. So one general question. So uh, do you expect something like this can be applicable to uh, infinite groups? Yes. Yes. So I would start with Tori. Yeah, exactly. This was basically my second question. Yes. Yeah. So yes, indeed, you can write down similar things. Uh, 
uh, for Tori, and that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. The second question basically was that uh, when you mentioned Kunyavsky work uh, and uh, uh, this work uh, for Tori of a non-closed field, so you can actually also geometrize this problem. So in some sense, it, yeah, yeah, and uh, all the same <laughs> that's, things. Makes that's precisely what he does. Nobody yeah. talks about fields. I mean, they only look everything. Yeah. G acting on G actions on lattices, and that's yeah. it. Everything is in terms of like actions on lattices. Okay. And the final, very, very small particular question. So, uh, your four fold example. So, it's actually singular. So, when you compute everything, did you first uh, resolve singularities? Yes. Yes. You, have to, you need to resolve singularities. The issue is. Uh, you mean the toric fourfold, right? The yeah, one yeah. that I gave you. Yeah. The Divide is, by degree one, 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 and P one. Yes, 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 yes. So the issue is that to get a C five stabilized, uh, to get a like the C two, there was a C two times. Uh, so to get uh, the C two stabilizer, like, right? So there's only one spot where you get the maximal action and and the stable. It's just only one component. There's only one stratum that matters. All the other singularities and the boundaries are smaller in, in these groups. And in this example, C2 times A5 is actually one of the maximal uh, irreducible subgroups in GL4Z. Yes, it is. It is precisely the maximal one that has trivial cohomological everything. Mm -hmm. There are these two families. There is C2 times S4 and C2 times A5. Mm -hmm. So I picked the A5 example. So. And uh, all subgroups for which there are known that, that there are no cohomological abstractions of stable rationality are subgroups of those. And there is a list of those for which rationality is still unknown, in particular, this one. And so. OK, good, perfect. Yeah. Uh, did you consider other maximal groups in JLN for that? Just, just no, well, again, there are only two for which there are no cohomological abstractions. Yeah, but... So the other ones uh, have cohomological abstractions. And therefore, uh, yes. So the statement is that uh, if, if you are stably rational and you are not known to be rational, then you are one of the subgroups of the 10 groups mm -hmm. in either Z2 times A5 or Z2 times S4. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. that's the result of work of yeah. many people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But your your problem makes also sense for not only from the point of view of uh, rationality, but also like G equivalent rationality. G equivalent, of maybe. G -equivalent, of course. Of course. Yes. Of course. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, Yuri. Uh, uh, please, uh, if you have questions to Yuri, ask him now. So okay. No questions. So, uh, Yuri, thank you very much. Excellent talk. I learned a lot and uh, it was really enjoyable. And I'll upload the recordings today in the evening uh, to the web page. Thank you very much. It was a big pleasure. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. I close the session. Bye. See you. Bye.